Earth. So we're already into an hour, so I think it's probably okay if I just plunge right in, right? Welcome. Yes. I hope you're enjoying your day here at the Trenton Computer Festival. My name is Josephine Jaimo. I'm going to talk about non-generative AI and the user experience and some of my experiences, my personal field notes, working on a number of AI-related projects. So I hope you're up for that. So, uh, here we go. Um, you can reach me via email or via LinkedIn. I'm going to keep on going here, see how this works. Um, my company, uh, where I do uh, consulting mostly around user experience research, is called User Experience Research. It's my LinkedIn profile again. I've worked in data science and the, you'll see the term UX on some of my screens. It does not, it's not an abbreviation for Unix. It stands for user experience. Okay. Um, and I know sometimes people say, well, what is the user experience? It's the whole experience. There's nothing existentially fancy about it. And I also am a worker. You know, I get paid to do work like that. Okay. Now, a lot of the people talking at this event today are going to be talking about generative AI and have been. Um, almost all of my experience has been in non-generative AI, and I thought it would be appropriate to have a brief discussion about the difference between the two. So generative AI models generate new and original content. Um, and the... The most important thing to me about generative AI in terms of how it learns is that it's non-supervised or self-supervised learning. That means there's no feedback loop when it learns, okay? Um, and by the way, in terms of, just in terms of um, housekeeping, uh, I should mention, I'm gonna go through a number of projects that I've worked on and just to make it easier for us, I thought I could, I could take questions and answers at any time, but I'm going to stop at the end of each project and then give you a chance to ask your questions. And then also at the end. So um, as I said, most of the uh, work I've done with AI has been of the non-generative variety. Welcome. Um, the neural networks I've worked on have been uh, developed using supervised learning. Um, some of the other projects I'm going to talk about include an expert systems project, uh, some work I did in the area of robotic process automation. How many of you heard of robotic process automation? Okay, we got a couple hands. Thank you. Um, so again, I've worked on supervised data models and machine learning projects that are supervised. So here's the question. This is like a thought experiment. I'll ask you to play along with me. We have inputs, we have the black box, and we have outputs. Do you care what's inside the black box? You know, you have input. We want the model to do something with that input and create an output. How many of you care how it happens? What's inside the black box? Nobody, that's okay. I'm a half a hand, okay. It depends, am I tasked with fixing it when it breaks? Fixing what's broken. Do I have to fix it when it's broken? Okay, that's why you care. You care because if it might break, then you might have to fix it, so you need to know enough about what's going on inside the black box so that you can fix it. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to keep going. How about this example? We all have like thermostats, heat controls in our homes, right? Um, how does your thermostat work? How many of you know, understand? how your thermostat works, how it actually works. One, two, I see a couple hands. Okay, so do we, would anyone care to explain 
I'll ask for someone from the audience to explain briefly, how does your thermostat work? How does it work? Go ahead. This coil at C2 mm -hmm. is made up of two materials mm -hmm. um, that have different properties. And when it gets hotter or colder, mm -hmm. the amount of that coil changes and tilts a mercury switch mm -hmm. somewhere in there and mm -hmm. either turns it on or off because it's balanced delicately in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really like that explanation. Now, um, now that all of you have heard that explanation, come on in. Um, do you care more about how your thermostat works than you did before you heard that explanation? You feel about the same, right? Most people, I'm going to propose, most people, they really don't care that much about how your thermostat actually works. Most people just, uh, you know, if I turn it one direction, the temperature goes up. If I turn it the other direction, the temperature goes down, right? Am I right? Maybe, right? Maybe, we'll see, right? So let's take another example. How about this example? Okay, well, we have inputs. Something happens in the middle, and then we have outputs. Do we care how it works? Go ahead. So, so I sort of care to know whether it's based on something scientific. You want, you want to know if it's based on something scientific or not. Fair enough. Okay, so you want to know enough about what's going on inside that it's based on science and it maybe it makes sense to you. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in? Thanks for participating in this thought experiment. I have another example for you. How about this example? This is a, a um, uh, um, it's, I think it's sold as a game or a toy called the Magic 8 Ball. Right, so you ask a question and you shake it, and then an answer miraculously appears. So, I guess we care about how it works, right? Is it a toy? Is it a real predictor of something, right? Okay, so thank you for uh, engaging in that thought experiment. We'll probably wind up swinging back around to that a bit as the afternoon progresses. So the first project, um, I proposed a framework and metric for evaluating the performance of AI in predicting project profits. I'm gonna talk briefly about this. Um, I built my own net neural network model Welcome. Without any uh, coding, I used software called BrainMaker, which was uh, developed by California Scientific. It's a no-code neural network application. I Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the data. Um, when I did this uh, research, data was kind of hard to find. This was a while back. Um, memory was still kind of expensive. A lot of people were not collecting a lot of data. There were no big data sets. So, um, it took a little doing to find, I found, uh, asphalt paving project data. And I used not just numeric data, but also symbolic data, including things like what was the name of the foreman and what was the weather like? Because I was looking to predict the profitability of asphalt paving projects. And so I compared the neural network models results to a standard statistical regression analysis. And I would routinely take my data set and I would uh, set up 
the data to be trained in the evening before I went to sleep at the computer next to the bed. And I would tweak my learning parameters and I'd watch the various uh, thermometers that indicated what was going on as the network was being trained. And uh, that was how I spent quite a number of weeks. And in the morning, miraculously, the network had been trained on the data using the learning parameters that I had set the night before. And what I used as a framework for comparing between the neural network model and the statistical analysis was a root mean squared as a metric. Because it's, you know, it's nice to have some basis for comparison, although I will tell you that the results were inconclusive, unfortunately. But the important thing, I think, uh, the important takeaway from this was that actually made a point of setting aside a metric in advance. So I want to talk briefly about how this all works inside the, so inside the black box of the BrainMaker software, we used a back propagation algorithm, which some of you may have heard of. I want to just mention it for those who care. Um, when you train the neural network, you do a forward propagation, then you take the error rate of that, you feed that loss backward through the neural network layers. You know, you have a, an output layer, you have a hidden layer, you have an input layer to fine tune the weights. So that's what was going on inside the black box that I was using. Okay, any questions about that project? I'll keep going, thank you. All right, I worked on a, um, an expert systems project for AT&T and we use several key metrics to uh, design and research this effort. Um, so here's the story, it's a little involved, but it's well, very well worth it. It's a really great story, I think. Uh, AT&T had this product called Frame Relay. It sends large amounts of data through the phone system and um, large volumes of data. And it actually, frame relay, relay consisted of about two dozen different systems that all were interconnected. And when the line broke, it was a big deal because you couldn't send the data through the phone line. And the clients were very big, very sensitive clients like hospitals and banks and publishing houses. And they were really upset when the line broke. So, you know, they had, ATT had this department of expert troubleshooting technicians to find out where the trouble was and refer it to be fixed. So the metric we used was called AIR, which stands for analyze, isolate, and refer the trouble. And it basically um, refers to the amount of time that the trouble ticket is open. Trouble ticket opens, the technician goes to work, analyzes, isolates and refers the trouble, and then hands it off to someone who fixes it. Okay, so, um, and the other thing, the other two things I would mention about this situation uh, um, are that it took AT&T two years to train its expert troubleshooting technicians to become experts because there were so many different systems and they were so complex and like that. And uh, they wanted to do something about that. They wanted to reduce the time that the trouble ticket was open. Oh, and the other thing I want to mention is that these systems were being upgraded and changed and upgraded and changed so quickly that when the technicians would get like a loose leaf binder with another set of documentation, it would already be obsolete before it was on the shelf. So this is the complex uh, dynamic situations people were working in. Okay, so um, I was part of a team that did a number of things, co-authoring the system engineering documents. I conducted cognitive walkthroughs of the 
user interface. Um, I conducted ethnographic research, which basically means I did sit in a cubicle with the expert troubleshooting technicians and observe them doing their work in real time. Um, I should say that the back end of this particular uh, solution, which was a decision support system, was a uh, not an off-the-shelf package, but it was a third-party package that uh, provided the expert system software. So what we're talking about here is um, a decision support system that deterministically stepped the technician through a series of tests. So think of a decision tree where you start at a point A. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, should mention this earlier. Before this pilot project came along, there were no standardized troubleshooting processes in place. So each of these technicians had their own way of doing things. So one of the very first things that we did on this pilot project was we got the subject matter experts together and we got them to create a standardized troubleshooting process for everybody. You can't really create an expert system without having a standardized troubleshooting process because everyone's going to use the same process, right? Otherwise, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. So the, the when the expert system was created, everyone started at the same point and there was a, a test that they all did as the first step. And then either the, the result of the test was either positive or negative. And then you would, uh, you know, if your test was positive, then you follow the positive branch. If your test was negative, you follow the negative branch. And so that way you just traverse the tree and eventually you analyze, isolate, and refer the trouble that way. But it's systematic. So it's like having an intelligent assistant. Am, am I being clear? Um, so uh, I conducted pilot training. I worked with the subject matter experts to select typical troubleshooting scenarios. So this is an expert system. It is AI. It's not generative AI, and it's not a neural network. And so what were our results? You know, that's what everybody cares about, right? The results. So we were able to significantly reduce the time it took to air the trouble, analyze, isolate, and refer the trouble. The so customers were a lot happier. We reduced the training time for expert troubleshooting technicians by more than 75%. So it took them now less than six months to become experts. And finally, because uh, we simplified the job design because we basically created an intelligent assistant for the troubleshooting technician to work with. Um, we simplified the job design and then created, wound up creating as a consequence, a bigger labor pool from which to find troubleshooting technicians because they didn't have to be as skilled because they had the intelligent assistant alongside them to step them through dynamically the process. Um, so it was, um, you know, a lot of big wins there. Um, quick, quick question. go ahead. Uh, how long ago was this? This was actually, you want to, you'll laugh. It, it was 1997. I was just, uh, hearing what happens today. Because today we have a strong standard and do So that's why I asked. Right, we do have, this was like, I think this was, in some ways it was ahead of its time. And I keep sharing it uh, in 2024 and uh, in the 21st century because um, there were so many things that went right, you know. And uh, I also share it because, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there right now who are, you know, they're big customer service budgets that a lot of organizations have. And the, one of the questions that comes up for me is, you know, if their systems are so user friendly and easy to use, why are their customer service budgets so big? Why isn't some of this uh, really able to be done by the customer themselves? What's going on there that, um, 
that um, you know th this isn't easier for an end user to actually use or do themselves. Go ahead. I didn't hear your question. Ethnographic oh yeah, the ethnographic research. Yes, thank you. The ethnographic research. I uh, basically I was working in um, Middletown, New Jersey at the time, and I would sit. And there were also network operations centers. I think there was one in Piscataway that I visited, and uh, I would sit in a cubicle all day with one of the expert troubleshooting technicians, and I would just observe what they did. You know, I would just, they'd open a ticket, they'd do some tests, they'd do some more tests, and uh, they'd narrow down, isolate the area where the problem was, and then they'd refer it on to uh, whichever party was responsible for making that repair. Can you just put notes on that and use that yeah. as some of your data? Yeah. 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 Exactly right. Yes. Do you have any specific system for taking notes? Do I have a specific system yeah, for taking notes? Like this, was there a certain a like approach, a strategy? You know, no, like, I, I, I don't, because um, you know, this is now we're talking about qualitative research now, right? So we're talking about. Um, uh, I mean, there are there are often guidelines in general for ethnographic research, but uh, in general, I just um, really attempt to do what they call deep hanging out with the user, where I just sit with them and I attempt to be the fly in the wall. I don't get involved. Maybe in between calls, I might ask a question. Um, I just take a lot of notes, and uh, you know, we're talking about um, maybe the mental model that the troubleshooting technician has of the problem that they're attempting to solve. So, um, you know, the fact that different um, troubleshooting technicians had a different approaches and there was no standardized pro process mm -hmm. suggests that different technicians are gonna have a different mental model for what it is they're attempting to look at and solve, right? So I think that one of the, actually one of the bigger takeaways from this project was the idea that um, there should be a standardized troubleshooting approach in the first place. Um, you will know, I was mentioned that, you know, sometimes expert systems um, have a probability factor factored into the uh, rules of the expert system. And in this case, they were 100% uh, deterministic and not probabilistic at all, which suggests to me that maybe if from the get-go, of course you can't rewrite history, maybe if they had had a standardized troubleshooting process from the beginning, they might not have even needed, the question is open, right? Maybe they didn't need an expert system in the first place if they had had a standardized troubleshooting process in the first place, and I'm making sense. Yes. Did they use a kind of back propagation to look at what was getting broken most often to feed it back into the system so that they could build better systems? No, although that would have been a nice thing to do once the, the system frame, re, the decision support system was adopted. That might be, you know, to keep track, you know, of, um, how often each type of problem occurred and maybe spend more time. That would be, you know, to quote, to quote someone who's coming to mind, that would be the next logical step, right? Like if 80% of your problems are in this piece of the network, then it would make sense to figure out why is that the weakest link of your chain, so to speak, right? Why does that piece keep breaking? That makes sense. So, so, so just a comment on that. Well, most of the things that I wrote, I put that in place now. But you know, when she was doing these things, it, it didn't exist. Okay, we're going to keep going. 
Okay. Let me talk a little bit about robotic process automation. Um, this was considerably smaller a project. And some people bring up the topic of robotic process automation when people talk about AI. Because it's, I'm sorry, it sounds like AI, right? It might even look like AI. But there are people who don't consider robotic process automation actually be AI. It's actually been around by, with other names um, attached to it. Okay, um, so I got connected with this organization that provides robotic process automation services. So it turns out that if you are going to uh, purchase robotic process automation services, kind of similar to what we were talking about before, uh, a standard process for solving a particular problem needs to be developed because as the, the name implies, robotic process automation, there's not a whole lot of decision making that needs to be made in a typical RPA implementation. So if you think, for example, I'm gonna use example of like, um, you go to the bank and you want to open a new checking account and you talk to a human being and they take down certain information for you. And you know maybe they have several different applications they have to open and close and then maybe they have to copy paste your address and your zip code in a couple of different places. No, and then maybe they have to wait for approval, like maybe your credit rating or whatever they ask for. So if you have a human being doing this, it can take maybe weeks. But if you have a robotic process automation implementation, it takes more like minutes. And the only time a human being intervenes is if there's some kind of error or some kind of ambiguous situation that the computer can't handle. So think about uh, what they call swivel chair work where information gets copied and pasted, say from one Excel spreadsheet to the other. And you'd be really surprised because I, you know, I, I, when I work with this provider, I learned that especially in various financial areas, mortgage lending, banking, um, there's a lot of this repetitive error prone work that could be eliminated, freeing up the person to do um, more challenging work or more interesting work and not have to rely upon the human being to copy paste this information from one application to the other. So uh, I'm not going to go onto YouTube to show you this UiPath example. UiPath is probably the most popular provider of uh, robotic process automation implementations today. I think Blue Prism is the other one. That's those are the top two. Um, so basically, what you would see, you'll you'll get the slides and you can look at the YouTube videos. It basically, um, if you were to transcribe data from a PDF into SAP from an email uh, and use UiPath to do it, the RPA would open the Outlook application and the file with the invoice in it as a PDF and then extract the data and validate it and copy it into SAP from the PDF. So the key actions that the robotic process automation software performs is it logs into the applications, which is an automated thing. It navigates through the screens, toggles between the applications. It converts the data into the correct format for SAP. Again, this is routine work that a, a human being would have had to do and, and extracts the data from the Excel spreadsheet into SAP. This is just an example. But you multiply that by so many times a day and it really does add up. 
So any questions about uh, our PA implementation? Okay. All right, now I'm gonna talk about another small project that I worked on. Um, it was uh, foundational research. So when um, a person has um, like an adverse health event um, and has health insurance, organizations like the one I was researching for get contacted and someone who's usually like a clinical social worker or licensed social worker contacts them on behalf of the insurance company to find out if they want to, at this point in their life, put any advanced directives in place for their health care, for any other aspects of their life. And usually the conversations occur over a period of about two months and there are about six phone calls. And it's very interesting that the conversations in general follow a particular trajectory regardless of the specific outcomes that the person is looking for. So the goal that this healthcare IT company had was to eventually um, create a kind of a data model for this. But um, as foundational work for that, I again conducted day in the life research where I sat alongside the licensed clinical social workers who were talking on the phone with the patients who were enrolled in these health insurance plans. And um, it was very interesting. I was able to make some preliminary recommendations, collected some data and like that. And I think that um, while they weren't doing AI yet, the eventual goal was to use an AI-based system to help guide those conversations and make it easier for them. Any questions about that? Okay, so like we're taking these slices of projects that are at different points. So it's kind of an interesting, I think it's an interesting kind of overview. All right, here's, I think this is my last project that I'm gonna talk about. How I used my background in machine learning and the user experience to provide user-centered documentation of an exciting new healthcare IT product. Okay. Okay, so this healthcare IT company had developed this new product for clinical researchers so that they could find trends and errors in clinical research data. So it used machine learning, it used big data in the cloud. Um, the, they had a couple dozen articles that were written by the biostatisticians who had worked on this project. And they were not, let's say, they were not very user friendly, okay? so. You know, it's wonderful when biostatisticians can write academic papers, but it's a different skill set to write something that the end user can actually use as a guide. So again, we get back to this idea of what's inside the black box, right? Do, do clinical researchers really care how the machine learning arrives at its results? I'm going to maintain that they probably don't, okay? They want to be able to look at variable A and variable B and look at the scatter plot and say, oh, well, here's where the trend is. Here are where the outliers are. That's what I want to know about. Because I have a hunch that maybe this, this variable is related to that variable. So I wrote or edited 100 user-centered articles. And by articles, it's, you can think of like a, a use case or a task. Um, and some of the uh, features were uh, vaguely described, but they, there was no, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of contact with the biostatisticians. So basically for some of the feature validation scenarios, I just reverse engineered 
uh, what the task would be because I didn't have the information. So it was a really great project for me because I was able to use my machine learning experience and none of the other writers in the department had any machine learning background. And um, as I mentioned, the biostatisticians could write really great academic documentation, but not anything that like an end user would be able to get a whole lot of, of uh, direction from for solving a problem or completing a task. Okay, so I was very happy. They did that work in 2015, okay, so that less than 10 years ago. And I was very happy, um, I guess it was two years ago now, to follow up and find out what had happened to this lovely project that I'd worked on. And then I learned that it was used to help uh, develop the Moderna vaccine. So, yeah, so I can imagine these clinical researchers looking at all their data, lots of clinical research data, you know, and remember they were working with compressed time frames. So this software was able to help them find trends and errors within the data set. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, to talk a little bit more about this project, the product that the software I worked on became part of was called Detect. As I mentioned, it's big data analytics. There's a proprietary machine learning algorithm. So again, we're talking about neural networks. Um, I mentioned here, clinicians can adjust the learning pr parameters, but probably won't. And we can talk about why. And this software processed up to 1 million data points in less than an hour. So that's pretty fast, right? Okay, so um, when I wrote these 100 articles, I, I would say that about 95 of them were of the how to, the how to variety, okay? I wrote a couple of articles that had to do with what goes on inside the black box. But I wanna share with you some of the learning parameters because I, I wanna give you a sense of what's going on inside the black box and offer, again, my argument that most people using this software, for example, don't really care. They don't have the background. What would they change these parameters to, even if they did, right? Because their subject matter expertise is in clinical research. It's not in neural network applications. So it's just for your amusement, right? So, so, so these are some of the specific skills that you had in machine learning that you were able to apply. Yes, it's just enough to be dangerous. Yes. So I, I noticed the first three bullet points refer to a cluster. Um, what what defines a cluster? Unless it's not. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question. Um. Go ahead. I like your answer. I like that answer. Thank you. Okay, fair question. Yeah, no, that's thank, thank you, both of you. 
Okay. So now I'm getting to the end of my talk here. Um, I talk about calculus-free, um, user-centered design research and related service for AI. This non-trivial, right? Because again, we're going back to the idea of what's inside the black box. How much do we need to know? How much do we care, right? Who are we as a user? What is our goal? I mean, we have a task orientation. We're trying to understand the whole system in depth. Those are different goals. Um, but AI has been around for decades, including non-generative non -generative AI. I hope I've given you some insight into some of those applications. The key thing to get about generative versus non-generative is whether this supervised learning or not. And I do recommend that you, in your spare time, which I know you all have a lot of, um, that you consider building your own no-code AI. It's not that hard. And I, in my slides here, I offer 10 no or low-code AI options that you can um, explore after this session. Which ones have you used? I have not used any of these. Okay. The Perfect. only one that I used was the uh, Brain Maker from California Scientific. But these are already a couple of years old. Any additional questions Is or comments? The Brain Maker free product? No, I, no you, I think you have to purchase it. Yeah, I had to purchase it. I really, I really like using it, uh, but I'm also a science piece myself. So I guess in, as an example, because I, I shared this example yesterday when I gave this talk, and I'm going to share it again today. Um, just as an example, you know, when someone gets an organ transplant, there's a concern about their body rejecting the organ, right? So it turns out that when that doctors give patients uh, medications, a protocol of medication to help them not reject the organ, right? Like a heart transplant or whatever, right? So you know, it turns out that there are several, seven different protocols for uh, doctors to choose from. And like, we don't have a lot of information. I mean, the doctors maybe have some experience, but, you know, you're talking about a situation where, you know, you want the doctor to choose the best of the seven for this particular person who has this, these particular characteristics. Maybe they have a certain blood type, maybe they have certain genetic uh, makeup or whatever, right? So there's no work that I would love to see someone create a neural network application that helps to predict which of these seven different protocols is going to have the best chance of success for this particular patient, right? And what I do know, because I knew someone who had gotten a heart transplant, is that that um, the hospitals were collecting this data. Now, this is a while back, but they were collecting the data um, on patients and their progress, favorable, unfavorable. And they would store it on magnetic tapes and keep it in the basement because they didn't know what to do with it. And at some point, they had so much data that they just started throwing it away because they didn't think it had any value. So I would love to see people think outside the box a little bit and realize that there are lots of unsolved problems out there that could be solved using, say, uh, a neural network, for example. Neural networks. Uh, can be used to classify information, to generalize, and to predict. So um, I think that one way to really learn about what you can and cannot do with, for example, a neural network is to build your own model. I really think that that clears up a lot of the ambiguity in people's minds about what's possible and what's not possible. Create your own model, implement it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to solve 
the world's biggest problems, but you will learn a lot and you'll have a much more realistic understanding of what's possible. And that will inform your future thinking.